Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the XPRIZE Carbon Removal Virtual Team Summit Air Track Session. Um, I'm Rupa Dandamudi. I manage team relations for the prize. Um, I'm joined here with Nikki Batchelor, who is our prize director, and Michael Leach, who's our technical director, Marcus Extivar, who's our VP of Energy and Climate, um, may be joining later. He um, has another commitment at the time. I'd like to go ahead and get us started. Um, we have a great panel of speakers today. Um, just a quick uh, rundown of the agenda is we're going to spend about half an hour with our speakers, a half an hour of Q&A, um, and, uh, and then we will follow with a breakout session uh, to allow all of you to network with each other and rotate around to different rooms, introduce, your, introduce yourselves to each other, share your elevator pitch. Um, we've gotten some good feedback on, on those sessions so far, so hopefully you'll find them useful. Um, so I just wanna introduce our great speakers that have joined us today. Thank you for, for making the time. Um, we have Holly Krutka, who's executive De director at the University of Wyoming School of Energy Resources. And she's also one of our X Prize judges. She also served as a judge on our previous Prize, uh, the NRG COSIA Carbon X Prize. So we're happy to have her um, uh, here today. Um, John Larson, Director of Rhodium Group, and Francis Wang, who's Program Manager of the Carbon Dioxide Removal Program at Climate Works Foundation. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Holly to get us started. Thanks, Rupa. Um, hi, everyone. Um, glad to talk to you today. Really appreciate your interest in the competition. Um, so I was asked to talk today a little bit about um, the CO2 storage site. So this is the air track. I'm going to focus on geologic storage, so underground storage, and share a little bit about what we have done in Wyoming and at the University of Wyoming School of Energy Resources, and hopefully that will be helpful to you as you think about how how to um, approach CO2 storage. So <clears throat> um, this could this could be a challenging area um, for for some folks. So um, it, I would say you're going to have to look at larger streams. So a thousand tons per year is not going to be sufficient to get your a whole well. So depending if your demonstration is of that scale. Um, you probably, it probably isn't going to make a lot of sense for you to get your own well. So you're going to have to look for other CO2 storage opportunities. There are, there are a few projects um, ongoing, so um, around the world, but, but not too many. Um, there's, so let me talk a little bit about, um, for I think most of you are probably aware, but just in case, uh, I think I better make sure I, I cover the big picture, but what we're talking about is the injection of carbon dioxide into the subsurface. We have to inject um, at least 3,000 feet below below the surface because that is where um, carbon dioxide becomes a, it, the pressure is high enough that it is a supercritical fluid. Um, so uh, when you inject to those, to those depths, you have to, pressurize the CO2 at the surface, then it then it gets um, injected. Um, and I see the comments, geological uh, sequestration is not the only pathway. That's just what I was asked to talk about. So um, absolutely not, not the only option here. Um, so, but if you are pursuing that geologic storage, um, you will need to work to develop a well that that is at depths sufficient for the CO2 to be, um, to be a supercritical fluid, and that's at least 3,000 feet. Um, in in the U.S., I would say we're the most advanced on um, the storage side. Although there's great work actually in the North Sea off of Norway, there's been CO2 injection for um, nearly 20 years. I think they are at about, I think it's about 17 years and 20 million tons of CO2. So large project. Um, the most CO2 that's been in, injected in the subsurface around the world is associated with enhanced oil recovery. I do think that's allowed under the competition, but you just have to calculate the overall carbon footprint. Um, so that that would be certainly something to consider as there's massive ongoing operations where CO2 is being injected um, in the U.S., particularly in um, states like Texas and Wyoming. Um, if you're if you're looking at 
um, CO2 injection into uh, dedicated storage or into saline aquifers, so not for enhanced oil recovery, I would point you to, in the U.S., um, two states. Well, I'll point you to one project. There's a project in Illinois that's ongoing now um, that is injecting CO2 into saline aquifer. I think they're up to about uh, over a million tons now. Um, yeah, there's the Quest project in Alberta, Canada. So those could potentially be um, entities you could outreach to to um, tie in with their existing operations. Um, if you are looking for designing your own well or, or getting a new well, um, there are two states you could, so we have the, these, let's see, where should I start? The permitting is, is um, focused on um, it's called Class 6 Well Permitting, and it's focused on, um, and it's under the water program at the Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S., the EPA. And so um, the federal EPA um, oversees and, and um, awards permits for Class 6 wells, except in two states, that's North Dakota and Wyoming. And in those states, we have primacy, which means our local um, in, in the case of Wyoming, the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality, DEQ, um, can permit those grants. So um, there are, this would, you, if you did pursue that option, you would not be the first, at least in Wyoming or North Dakota. We both have um, uh, applications for class six wells that have been submitted for CO2 storage. Um, so those could be opportunities as well. Um, I would also point you to um, there's going to be a lot happening in the U.S. in the next couple of years. The infrastructure package has um, that you may have heard of that passed has uh, two and a half billion dollars for CCUS hubs. So that might be an opportunity to look where those hubs are being placed and to see if there's if there's any opportunity um, to tie in with one of those hubs. I'll just tell you nothing's happened yet, but certainly in Wyoming, we're going to be trying to compete for federal funding to build one of those hubs. And one of our, our concepts would be to go ahead and permit wells and permit um, and, and actually construct the wells, drill them. And then when CO2, um, whether it's CO2 removal or CO2 capture projects, <laughs> they can just plug in and, and inject their CO2. So that's, it's just an idea, but, but it could move relatively quickly as that infrastructure funding from that um, is released for um, use. So something else to think about. Um, I would say there, there are all kinds of resources available um, on on CO2 storage in the subsurface, um, but particularly, you know, there, I think um, World Resources Institute, Global CCS Institute have done some work on um, stakeholder outreach and, and how to talk to communities um, for um, these kind of projects. And certainly it's something we're working on here at the School of Energy Resources. We're actually, to, drilling a well, which is class one, which means it's just for testing, and we're going to convert it to a class six well, and we're drilling over the holidays. So our, our Christmas cards or our holiday cards from School of Energy Resources say Jingle Bells Holiday Wells, and um, so that's what we're doing over the holidays here, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, um, the key to successful subsurface injection really is um, engaging with the local public extensively, and so if you're, if you choose to join up with a project, you find a CCS hub, you find a, a CO2 injector you can work with that you probably would want to be part of that process. But generally, I would say um, on the technical side, the risks um, are, are covered by the class six permitting. So um, generally, we feel that these wells will be safe and effective. And you can have confidence that if you're working with someone who has a class six permit and they're going to inject CO2 into the subsurface that they have been through a very rigorous process to get to get that um, permit awarded to them. So um, and so and then I would just make a pitch to look at Wyoming. We have a lot going for us in in that we have one of, we have the least populated state in, in the U.S. We have been working on CO2 storage rules and making this an attractive place for investment in um, for decades in the state, both through the Wyoming legislature and then the work that's done here at the University of Wyoming. So um, I hope that you will, as you look at opportunities, consider 
um, and, and that's not just for CO2 storage. I would say, yes, go Pokes, yay. Um, I would say that uh, we are really interested in building up a carbon removal industry here in the state. And so we are interested in the other sectors. Um, like I said, I was asked to talk about air and geologic CO2 storage today, but we're interested in all the above, soil storage and other options. So um, thank you so much. And Rupa, with that, I'm going to stop talking now. Okay, thank you so much, Holly. Great. Um, I'm going to hand it over to John Larson uh, next. Thanks, Rupa. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, John Larson, I direct U.S. Energy Research at the Rhodium Group. We're an independent research firm that uh, where my team spends most of our time looking at ways to accelerate decarbonization uh, of the U.S. energy system and economy and also uh, how to scale up emerging clean technologies like uh, all the carbon dioxide removal uh, options that you folks are exploring. So it's great to be here today on such a great panel with Fra Francis and Holly. Um, I thought, you know, so most of our work, or at least most of the time, the work that I'm developing, developing and working on is U.S. focused. So I was going to spend most of my remarks talking about the U.S. context, uh, but obviously, uh, this challenge, both of climate change and scaling up carbon dioxide removal, is definitely a global one. Um, and I think it's just worth kind of always uh, recentering ourselves around the the end game here, which is, uh, you know, if you believe, if you look at the IPCC reports, we're talking about if everything goes right on decarbonizing other sectors, we may still need 10 to 20 gigatons of carbon dioxide removal annually by mid-century around the world. And from our estimates that it, about, you know, 10 to 25% of that could occur in the United States. Uh, that is that is huge. Um, just to put that in context, we're talking about um, carbon dioxide removal by mid-century that's roughly equivalent to running uh, all of the emissions from every large stationary source in America, every factory and every power plant in reverse. Uh, on an annual basis. Um, more importantly, it took more than a century to build out all of those factories and power plants I was just talking about that are in place today. And we've got basically 30 years to, to get everything going um, uh, up again in, in the context of carbon dioxide removal. So, you know, the challenge is uh, quite large, uh, but I still think it's quite doable with the right effort and I think the right uh, attention and investment and innovation. So thanks all of you for spending a lot of your time and mental capacity on this problem. Um, obviously carbon dioxide removal is one key technology suite among many that we're gonna need uh, to get to net zero in the US and globally. Ultimately, uh, things like direct air capture will depend on the success or failure or the role of direct air capture and carbon dioxide removal is gonna depend on the success or failure of other technologies. Um, and how they're applied to decarbonization. So for example, uh, you know, it's pretty common convention that, you know, step one, clean the electric power sector up and decarbonize that, get that to zero. Step two, electrify everything else. Well, what if we don't get fully to zero in the power sector? Or what if we don't electrify fast enough? Uh, the short answer is we're gonna have to find tons elsewhere. And uh, the real swing capacity here is gonna be carbon dioxide removal. So, uh, you know, I would, I definitely, we at Rhodium definitely see CDR across the board um, as kind of a, a critical place to maintain as, men, as much optionality as possible uh, for getting to net zero. Um, because, you know, some other options uh, either may not pan out at all or won't scale fast enough uh, to help uh, contribute to the ultimate end game here. Um, with, when it comes to CDR and making sure that uh, it is affordable and readily available everywhere we need it around the world uh, in time. Uh, the most important thing from our view is getting costs down as fast as possible. Um, you know, uh, when you're at lab scale or bench scale, uh, obviously um, the, it's, it's a long ways off to get to something close to like 50 to 100 bucks a ton on an annualized basis, but that's ultimately where uh, all of this needs to be driving towards because uh, if, it's not affordable, CDR is just not gonna scale. Um, and, you know, I wanna just, you know, laud the XPRIZE Foundation for setting up this prize because that's obviously a big part 
of uh, what this whole exercise around the prize is, is about. So thank you for devoting all the attention to it. Um, Ahali mentioned the uh, infrastructure bill that just passed in Congress. Uh, it's worth noting that there's a whole bunch of new federal money and federal programs uh, that will be uh, refocusing and ramping up a new to focus on carbon dioxide removal and some of the uh, related uh, necessary technologies like CO2 infrastructure, injection and sites characterization for storage, uh, and a lot of the other kind of overlapping technology needs. Um, and that's super exciting. Uh, I think uh, there is going to be more money and more federal effort in the space in the coming you know, few years than we've ever seen. Um, and uh, that's gonna go a long way to getting demonstration projects off the ground and getting some of the first of a kind uh, options up and running and steel on the ground. But that's just the first inning for all of this. Uh, even if costs do decline dramatically for CDR, it's not gonna scale without a market and without uh, robust demand at the scale, uh, at the gigaton scale in the long run here for carbon removal so services or else uh, all of these efforts are going to plateau. They're not gonna be able to scale because nobody's gonna want carbon dioxide removal. And I think you know the, the activities in the private sector, uh, companies like Stripe and other technology firms that are actually trying to prime the market and um, get, uh, get at least an, an initial set of revenue streams for CDR vendors uh, available is critical to uh, getting things started, but uh, there's nowhere near enough CO2 demand or carbon dioxide removal demand from, from that set of actors to get us where we need to go. Um, and at the end of the day, this is where some sort of serious uh, set of state and federal policies are gonna be needed. Um, to to get um, to get where we need to go on on ultimate like gigaton scale CDR, uh, I would note that uh, another bill currently uh, in the doldrums in Congress, the Build Back Better Act, would go a long way to uh, adding additional demand for carbon dioxide removal in America. So uh, there's a few different ways that could work. There's federal procurement investment um, around low carbon building materials and other things and, and even CDR that could be really useful again for market priming. But more importantly, there is a uh, uh, $180 per ton director capture tax credit uh, when, when it's coupled with geologic storage that uh, could be really, really meaningful for uh, getting serious uh, megaton scale projects off the ground. Um, so watch the space because hopefully something will pass the Senate that will ultimately help uh, really start to build a, a, an honest to goodness commercial scale market for CDR in America. There's also other stuff in the bill around agricultural carbon dioxide removal programs. So there's, there's a lot of different opportunities there. Um, even with cheap CDR and real demand, uh, don't underestimate non-cost barriers to deployment. Um, so these are, uh, uh, Holly, I think spent her 10 minutes focus squarely on some of these, which I think is really important, which is like, how are you actually going to get that CO2 where it needs to be to make it stop damaging the climate? Uh, and things, you know, as mundane as siting and permitting could ultimately make or break a lot of this. Uh, infrastructure availability is another one, uh, making sure that uh, everybody who needs it has access to affordable geologic storage and access to any information to find the best, most suitable storage sites. It's going to be huge. Uh, supply chain bottlenecks for the actual inputs and feedstocks into carbon dioxide removal machines. Uh, access to all the affordable clean energy we're going to need to run this stuff are all other things that are going to be needed to get tackled at scale if we're going to get there. Um, and this is while we're trying to decarbonize the entire energy system on the on the supply side. So uh, I'm not trying to be too negative here. I'm just trying to like help everybody appreciate uh, the challenge ahead and the scale. And uh, so you know, uh, I hope everybody um, not only puts in puts their all into their efforts here on the prize, but also thinks ahead to how their solutions are going to fit in this bigger. Um, bigger space and how we're going to get from here to net zero in a timely fashion. So with that, uh, I wanted to thank everybody again for your time and I look forward to Q&A. Great. Thanks so much, John.
Um, I'm going to hand it off to Francis next. Great, thanks Rupa. Um, I actually do have a slide deck, so I will stay off uh, camera and share the slides with you. All right, um, are we in good shape there? Can you see, okay. Rupa? We can see. Sorry, okay. I was on awesome. mute. Yes, we can see. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, okay, great. Um, so hi everybody, uh, my name is Francis and I am part of ClimateWorks. Uh, it is a philanthropic platform and we generally provide grants to address gaps in science and governance to accelerate promising solutions to scale. Uh, today, our grant making is around a billion dollars across 50 countries and CDR is one of the 10 programmatic areas at ClimateWorks. We don't typically fund private sector companies, uh, which is why I'm super grateful that XPRIZE is filling this very important gap. Our funding is categorized into mainly two buckets. So we fund basic science, so things like modeling removal potentials for climate policy, and the other is around governance, uh, which include policy advocacy and education, communications and social perception, and international removal conversations. And I've been asked to focus my talk on the last, last of the two areas, so the social perception and the regulatory landscape outside of the United States. Um, but very quickly, these two graphs show the potential support for director capture year on year from the US and the UK government. And as you can see, prior to 2019, there was very limited support for research. And the current support we're seeing for director capture is the result of tireless education and outreach by the stakeholders, where effective messaging and communications are particularly catalytic for the field. So on that topic of messaging comms, um, I will share primarily the results of three large end voter polls that we did. Um, so two are at the national level, focused either on director capture and CDR respectively. And one is at the local level, which is done at the Kern County and the Delta region in California. It is focused on carbon capture and storage, but it does have implications for project level director capture deployment in these regions. Um, the overarching findings are not surprising. While over half of their surveyed voters support CDR or DAC, their understanding of what it is and how it works is relatively low. After receiving a tailored messaging about the technology itself, the favorability uh, for these technology increases across the board for voters across the political spectrum uh, and across racial and age groups. Uh, you can see that, you can see the shift from the red to the blue uh, in the graph. This shows uh, basically that a modest amount of education may lead to an increased public support. People also uh, especially expressed strong positive reaction to the discussion of how director capture increases jobs and how it is supported by a majority of scientists. Generally, the survey identified concerns that are common towards industrial projects, such as you know, concerns around health and air quality, the survey individuals are also worried how this would impact solar wind deployment, given the limited funding available for climate in general. In addition, there is a concern that director capture would perpetuate the use of fossil fuels through EOR or because of the moral hazard and delayed mitigation. This is the largest concern that we've seen uh, from in particular environmental justice communities because of the historic injustice the fossil fuel companies have committed against the marginalized communities. So to reach scale, it is important for the DAC industry to clearly demonstrate its allyship to meaningful climate action, because there are many examples where the world decides not to pursue a technology because it's antithesis to social morality. So aligning with fossil interests may not be very helpful in the long run, where DAC deployment requires widespread social acceptance. So on that point, I just wanna show some examples where DAC is raising concerns in the EJ community that may eventually have implica implica implications on project development. So in May this year, the White House EJ Advisory Council released its final recommendation where it noted DAC and CCS are not compatible with environmental justice objectives. In July, 500 mostly grassroots organizations published letters urging the lawmakers to reject CCS, where Director Capture is also mentioned in the same letter. And in December, we see the initial response or acknowledgement to these concerns formally through the request for information from the Department of Energy in the US, where Secretary Granholm especially referenced environmental justice and concerns from historically marginalized communities. The DOE is looking to require submissions of EJ-related information as part of the project proposals. 
In the public dialogue, DAC is often lumped together with CCS, whereas in reality, as we know, DAC, is, DAC clearly serves a different, different role in climate action. It is compatible with renewable energy and often don't require large infrastructure, but it's unclear whether there is that thorough understanding of the difference outside of the CDR community. And we know from polling that education helps. So outreach coupled with responsible action will likely reduce community resistance, which could be beneficial for the scale up in the long run. So in the message testing, the posters found it's helpful to emphasize that like many technologies, carbon removal and director capture can be done responsibly or irresponsibly. Since we need CDR to have a safe planet, we should develop and follow guidelines to ensure responsible CDR that in particular creates jobs and benefits the economy. And like I mentioned, there's still quite a bit of confusion around the source of CO2, which can be detrimental because DAC is more expensive in the marketplace. So it's always helpful to reinforce that difference between DAC and other types of carbon capture in your outreach and communications. The message testing also found a helpful framing using both and. Uh, for example, how that works in reality is you could discuss mitigation as a priority for climate while clarifying that scientific recommendation shows CDR is also part of an impactful climate action package. Even though nature-based solutions is more popular on its own, the voters did express a both and preference when it comes to using both nature and technology to address climate issues. And finally, we found that only 6% of the surveyed voters have heard of director capture, but more have heard of carbon removal. So it can be helpful to discuss this in the context of CDR and talk about a portfolio approach. And finally, on the messaging, just a very quick note on the messengers. The most trusted messengers by voters surveyed are scientists and those who are seen as guardians of local interests. Project developers are some of the least trusted. So think about building alliances and effectively convey the message across that is rooted in local understanding and context will be helpful. Um, I'm gonna switch gears here since I did promise to talk about NIE US um, uh, regulatory landscape for, for CDR and director capture. We uh, So I'll talk about Europe here. Uh, we've been working in Europe since 2018. In general, the EU has taken a thoughtful but conservative approach to carbon removal. The EU law provides a clear distinction between removal and reduction through the separate 225 megaton removal target by 2030. Even though this target is only accounting for land-based negative emissions, the new communication, uh, which is called the Sustainable Carbon Cycles Communication that was released a couple of days ago, noted a 5 uh, million ton goal from technological removal, so that's BECS and DAC, by 2030. Given that the current production is less than a percent of that, so there is a long way to go and a lot of opportunities there. And under that umbrella, CDR is then dealt with in different legislative contexts. The most recent communication that I mentioned provides a relatively coherent description of the EU CDR strategy. So I would encourage you to give it a read. The, some of the more notable information that may be useful here include one, a requirement for carbon stock take. So any tons of CO2 captured, transported, used and stored needs to be accounted for by origin by 2028. The certification mechanism, which certifies removal that has happened and facilitates credit purchases. It also provides a scientifically robust requirement for MRV, so monitoring, reporting, and verification. And this work will move forward in 2022. The goal, uh, there is a goal of 20% of CO2 used in chemical and plastic products should originate from sustainable non-fossil resources uh, sources by, 20, by 2030. Um, and on funding, which I know many of us are very interested in, currently the Horizon 2020 program funds some basic research for carbon removal. Uh, for example, there is a project called NEGEM that identifies promising and scalable negative emission technology pathways, but support for pilot stage projects are very small uh, in the EU. And this communication referenced future EU innovation fund and Horizon Europe calls to cover CO2 transport, storage, DAC, and BEX. And finally, this document also acknowledged the other challenges to CDR in Europe, which is a lack of CO2 infrastructure, in particular supranational pipelines. And it does request a study for cross-border CO2 infrastructure deployment needs at the regional and the national level to 2030 and beyond. Uh, a quick comment on geologic storage. Uh, there's the challenge when it comes to geologic storage in Europe is a shortage of existing storage capacity where small startups may find it difficult to get a seat at the table to procure initially small amount of storage volumes. Uh, 
So for those looking for more information on that, the CCS directive established the legal framework and does cover all geologic formations in the European economic area. Um, and on a separate note about offtaking utilization, there is a separate proposal in play that will uh, likely make it into law in some form um, called the Refu EU Aviation. Uh, it, it proposes a one to two percent mandate use of e kerosene by 2030. So that's about a megaton of oil equivalent by 2030 with penalties for non compliance. Um, and the e-kerosene can be made either through fossil sources or non-fossil sources like direct to capture. And as many of you know, um, you know, long-haul aviation exclusively relies on fossil fuel today. Uh, and there is an emerging effort to ensure that there are some preferences given to direct to capture based fuels by recognizing that it contributes to a circular economy. Okay, so I will end with this slide. Outside of the US and EU, countries are waking up to the need for CDR. China recently signed a joint declaration with the US to cooperate on the deployment of DAC. The mission innovation for CDR sets the goal of 100 uh, million ton a year removal potential by 2030 with Saudi Arabia and Canada. The South Korean government recently released their carbon neutrality roadmap specifically indicating that the use, uh, specific indicating they wanted to use removed or captured CO2 to create sustainable fuels for grandfathered cars. And they use direct capture to recapture that CO2. So I imagine the momentum will continue in 2022, and I encourage you to look beyond the U.S. Uh, for opportunities in offtaking and project deployment. And that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Francis, and thanks, thanks to all our speakers today. Um, with that, let's get into the Q and A. So. Uh, everyone, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's an icon that says reactions. Um, from there, you can raise your hand. And that's how I'll be able to sort of see, um, to call on you to ask the question. So um, go ahead and raise your hands. And then when I call your name, feel free to get on camera and uh, ask your questions. So the first question is from Perry Goldberg. Hi. Hi Perry. Hello, everybody. I have a question for Holly. I'm just curious to hear what's the typical permitting time, whether it's for the EPA or for the two states that you mentioned? Yep, great question. So the EPA, I don't know if they have a typical permitting time quite established yet. I do think it would be on the, the um, scale, if I had to guess, maybe 18 to 24 months. North Dakota says they can do it in eight months. Wyoming will try to beat North Dakota, but um, they're, they're a little bit ahead of us in their, in their process on their first one. So I think that would be a good planning time scale for you to think of. So, but for sure, the two states with primacy are going to be faster than going through the EPA. And I didn't mention, but probably should have that, um, that Louisiana has now applied for class X primacy as well. And several, several other states are looking at it. So um, if that's awarded, um, then, then that, the number of opportunities could grow for as far as states, but you definitely want to focus on the states if you're if you're worried about timing. Thank you. And then it's also just in terms of the cost. Are you able to say anything on what the average costs are for these permits? That's a good question. Um, I, I would, well, I, I, I'm scared to speak out of turn because we're, we're underway right now. Um, but being that we're at a research institution, you know, we're, it will cost us, um, we're, we're doing subsurface tests as part of research projects. So I think our costs are going to be higher. So I, I probably, I'm not, I'm not going to answer that, but I do, I think as order of magnitude, um, I wouldn't say it's not going to be millions, um, but it's not going to be tens of thousands. So <laughs> you can kind of guess order of magnitude there probably. So. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question is from Celine. Celine oh, Chow? Yeah. Hello. Hi, um, I actually have two questions, if that's okay. Um, so the first one is when you are calculating our net one kiloton capacity, do you take our nominal plant size and subtract it by um, the emissions that Carbon Direct calculates for us? So for example, what if we have 
um, a plant with nominal capacity of 1.5 kiloton, but then after subtraction, we're, we're, we fall a little bit short. Um, can you comment on what happened in those cases? Yeah, great question. So the answer is yes, that's how the calculation works. Um, we uh, uh, do not consider like, like the one kiloton thing isn't necessarily like a, like a firm, firm, hard and fast requirements, you know, as long as you're in the right ballpark, um, that should be fine. Um, so it's like, if you're at, if, if you hit 900 or whatever, then, then, you know, I, I, I think that that's a forgivable sin provided you meet all the other requirements of the competition. Um, uh, we are also, um, we'll be feeding back to each team, you know, the results of this exercise so that, so that you have a, a way to sort of recalibrate things, um, in the next round. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you, Michael. And um, my second question is, um, in terms of sequestration, um, what kind of partnership or, or documentation are you looking for? Is it okay to say, um, we've talked to some people, we, we know these sites would be good for geological sequestration, but we don't have, um, for example, a contract in place. Would, would that be okay? Uh, yeah, as long as you can articulate exactly what your plan is for, um, for getting, getting that uh, agreement in place as part of your project plan, that should be, that should be sufficient. All right, thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, next question is from Grant Pace. Hi, um, so based on uh, what Francis was talking about with the role of CDR in, for example, um, reducing aviation emissions, um, I was wondering if the judges of the competition um, would potentially see that as a viable option, um, given that as it is right now, there's no way to have carbon negative fuels because anything you combust is going to be emitting things. Um, but is it possible that the judges would be open to CO2 to fuels given that there would be an immense CO2 emissions reduction through that process? So from the competition perspective, um, emissions reductions or offsets are not uh, are not considered in scope for the competition. So if your if your project um, does reduce emissions from another sector or offset emissions from another sector, you could call that a co-benefit, but we're not counting that as removals. Um, um, yeah, I, Holly, do you have anything to add to that? I don't know if you're still with us, Holly. Sorry, I'm here. Um, I know. I mean, I think that was more of um, a rules question. So um, I don't. I don't think so. I think. You... Yeah. All right. So uh, I guess I'm next. Um, uh, so how much stress will you guys put, like, when you're grading these applications on the megaton, the gigaton portion of the application? on how the technology can be integrated with renewable energies, as well as how you can scale the technology and the renewable energies to the gigatons. Um, yeah, again, I'll, I'll um, let uh, Holly comment from her perspective. You know, from my perspective as at, on the prize administration team, um, we're looking for, um, for the teams to have basically think through the issues related to megaton and gigaton scalability. So on the megaton side, what are the, the key question is like, what are the costs associated with getting a megaton project off, off the ground? At the gigaton scale, the key question is really about like, well, what, what issues are going to hinder your gigaton scale deployment? And I mean, I, you know, it, with regards to your comments specifically about renewables, that's going to be a key um, piece of of most <laughs> applications, if not all applications. So I think that there's a there's a fair amount of um, uh, um, a, a fair a fair amount of sympathy for 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 that point. But um, having having you know if you can kind of like explain what those issues are and articulate a plan for for how you can overcome some of those issues, that's that's really you know fundamentally what we're looking for. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I can comment. I mean, just based on our experience from the last competition, I will say, um, if your if your um, carbon footprint depends and you choose to um, use energy sources for renewables, then 
intermittency issues cannot be, you know, they do need to be addressed in a meaningful way. Um, that's, I'm, I think that's really serious and that's, um, was important to us on, on the last Carbon X Prize. So as judges, um, so I think, I think that's really critical. I will tell you, um, on the question regarding getting to gigaton scale, I think what we would be, well, at least what I would be looking for, I can't speak for all the judges, would be fatal flaws. So you really have to, um, you know, be able to, I don't, I guess you don't have to have it all figured out, but you cannot have clear fatal flaws. Let's put it that way. Thank you. Hey, um, <clears throat> next question is um, from Will Hesser. Hi guys, thank you so much. Um, this question also pertains to carbon neutral fuels. Um, and so being that they are out of scope for removal, you still need a thousand tons of, of carbon removed um, for phase two outside of that. If like electrofuels or biofuels were a, a byproduct of what you were doing, when it comes to the life cycle emissions intake form, because we have to factor in emissions from, you know, say you have, you know, concrete structure, materials to build out the infrastructure that has to be accounted for, or you have machinery made of steel that you have to replace every eight years. All of that has to already be accounted for, but can some of those emissions in the leaf be offset by the fact that you are also now reducing emissions in other sectors through carbon neutral fuels? Um, the short answer is no, not at this round. Um, you basically any co-product that um, that has a end of life that would suggest that it will be combusted needs to be assumed that it is combusted and counted as an emission. Um, but you know, definitely, if that's what you're doing, like make the case, explain to the judges that there that 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 is the nature of your of your product, and and we give you. Uh, ample opportunity in the submission to explain that, um, but but the 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 point of the competition is is basically is is removals only. You know, we we want to see net drawdown is the is the whole point here. So, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is from Brittany Zimmerman. Hello, two quick questions for you guys. Um, the first is in regards to the megaton versus gigaton question again. Um, if our uh, first online uh, pilot plant is at the gigaton level, um, is it okay for us to take all of our analyses from gigaton and put it in to that megaton slot? Or do you want us to take everything that we've done to scale ourselves up to a gigaton and kind of work our way backwards to fill in the megaton space? Um, yeah, interesting, uh, interesting question. Um, I, I mean, you know, at, so, so the, the premise of the competition is kind of demonstration at a, at a kiloton, cost analysis at the megaton, and then, and then scalability at the gigaton scale. And so at all three of those scales, we want to see um, as much justification as teams can provide. So, I mean, obviously, if you're doing uh, analysis at the gigaton scale, that would be applicable to the, the, the megaton scale, right? So I, I think you can, you know, without knowing the specifics of your, of your project, um, you, can, you can kind of, you know, use those cases to support each other. Okay. Um, I, think, I think that's fine. And then the last question, Michael, is with regard to insurance. Um, uh, if we have we have our key components tested, right? Some of some of our key components are in university laboratories. Uh, some of our key components are in private laboratories. Um, none of those facilities are fully owned by our team, right? They're owned by other groups or institutions. What do you suggest I do on the insurance side of things to make sure I'm doing what, you know, you the intent of what you guys are aiming for? Yeah, so the intent is that any on the ground operations need to be covered and the coverage needs to extend to both your team and the, the tests themselves. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there's a number of ways to skin that cat. You know, you've got a lot of, a uh, lot of, um, fingers and a lot of pies and, uh, you know, we are very happy to accept, um, like policies from institutions or other organizations that you're working with, provided the, um, the, that you, you have that, you know, the coverage to cover your team and your, and, and your you demonstration. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of wiggle room there. You know, we just need to make sure that, um, that should there be an incident, um, that, that, the, that the team is adequately protected. That's all. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Next question is from Colby Freeman. Hi, so um, can y'all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I had a question going back to um, kind of the idea that that teams could come together and um, like say there's several teams that are capturing carbon and then all of it is going into the same storage project, the same sequestration area, um, how would you go about accounting for the emissions associated with building that storage project um, and splitting those amongst the teams? Is it going to be like a percentage of the storage that is um, done by the one team, if that makes any sense? Uh, that's a really good question. I haven't, I don't really have an answer for that. I think that the, um, you know, you can kind of take a look at your situation and come up with, with the best, uh, a best estimate, you know, either a per ton estimate or a per project estimate, um, you know, and, and just kind of like outline your rationale and show us how that calculation works. And, and, um, and, and that's where I recommend you start. Um, but, but, you know, the, to our speakers who are still on the line, like, is, is there a, is there a standard of practice in terms of, of allocating emissions from a large project to, um, you know, to smaller projects for, for the purposes of life cycle? There may not be a clear answer on that. So <laughs> why don't we leave it at that for now? Those will all have to figure it out. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Next question is from Thomas uh, Ox. It's Ox, but uh, oh, the, every, everybody gets it wrong at least the first time. That, that's not a problem. Uh, the, the question, I don't know if Michael's the right one or who is, but uh, as we're putting our equipment together, um, you know, we've got a, a schedule laid out and we will not be done or well, maybe we'll be in process, but not be done by the time uh, the project is completed with the thousand tons. Um, can't will that be um, uh, something that you will look at and see the rate at which we are uh, sequestering our carbon dioxide as opposed to the total amount? For instance. If we're up and running with six months left to go, mm-hmm. um, and and we're running at a rate that is easily at you know the one thousand tons per year, but we haven't sequestered it um, because you know we've been working on fairly complicated equipment over a period of time. Will that be something you will look at, examine, and look at the engineering information and make a judgment as to the rate as opposed to the total quantity? Uh, yeah, the answer is uh, yes. Now, what you're talking about is, um, is uh, you know, in February of 2024, we're going to be taking in another submission and, and taking a look at where each team is at and assigning site visits. So really the question is um, what, you know, what teams are granted a site visit? And um, and I, I believe the judges are are you know just my experience with this group, they'll be interested in looking at things in kind of a holistic fashion. But the but at the end of the day, it really is a competitive process, and so teams that are up and running as of February 2024 will likely get get preference. So no so no, no that's, of, yeah, but yeah. that's not that's not my concern. My concern okay. is. I expect to be up and running. I've got you know things laid out. I actually have a margin 
uh, just in case. But uh, I expect to be up and running. I expect to be up and running at a variable rate when I want to run. Um, and I expect to be able to demonstrate that I can do the thousand tons of air, air captured CO2. But the complication of the equipment, the installation, supply chain problems that we've got that we're looking at right now, all of those things are going to say it's going to be a squeeze to get it up and running a year ahead of time. Which, you know, I mean, that only gives us a year to build things. And instead, we're looking at probably 18 months to build build out and, you know, shake down and get running. That would mean I'd only have six months of running experience uh, at the time you guys start inspecting. It would not be a thousand tons at that point. Uh, it might be half of that. But yeah. the rate would be the thing you know, from an engineering perspective that I think you might be interested in. Can, can yeah. you just make that clear? Yeah, the requirement of the competition is we want to see a thousand tons of removal in the final year. So if that's back end loaded, that's okay. Um, the, the point is, um, is uh, you need to show evidence of operations and, and give the judges an idea of where you're headed by that February 2024 deadline. And that is a competitive process. So I can't, I can't, you know, guarantee things one way or another, but that's, um, that, that's our, that's our approach. Okay. <clears throat> Next question is from Sebastian uh, Jeremilo. Yes. Hello. Uh, my question is about the changes in the legal entity of the team. So during the development of the initial phase of the project, I found a company that has a complete technology and the third party verification in process of it. But due to intellectual property issues, we will, uh, will, we will only be able to participate in the carbon removal challenge if we change the actual legal entity uh, from a, a, the actual one to the company that we're working with. So can, how can we do this? How can we change? How can we change the legal entity and still be able to participate in the in the phase one of the competition? Yeah, sure, I can answer that. Um, we can change your legal entity. Uh, you um, just need to contact us with the correct legal entity and who the signatory should be on behalf of that legal entity, um, it would be an amendment to your current competitor agreement. Um, so it's something that we can send over to you electronically. We would just need the, the name of the person to sign their contact information, their email address, and the correct name um, of, the, of the new legal entity, as well as your team name. So it's a pretty, pretty easy uh, um, switch that we can do. Okay, do you have any email that I should talk to or the person or, or should I send this information to it or? Just... Um, you can send it to carbon removal at xprize.org and in the subject line, um, just say change of legal entity so we know how to um, categorize it. Thanks. Thank you. Oh. Okay, next question we have is from uh, Carbono Blanco. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Omar Osorio from Carbono Blanco. Uh, carbon capture is uh, the public interest now. Um, and I, I would like to, to ask um, if uh, XPRIZE could give us all uh, push or support in order to obtain or in order to talk with uh, this support with maybe authorities or, or public um, governments maybe in order to obtain some uh, facilities, some, um, uh, some help or, or for everyone to, to develop our um, strategies. So it could be great if you say something maybe public or maybe for all participant support to um, um, create this possibility with uh, some authorities. So 
that's the question. So could you give us some support? It's, it's yeah, the, yeah. Well, I appreciate I appreciate the, the question and, and really the suggestion. This is the sort of thing that we like to do. Um, and it's something that we're considering doing next year um, for the, you know, once the milestone round is complete, um, we'll okay. really shift our focus to trying to okay. uh, facilitate um, all of you in, in building your scaled up operations. So, you know, if anyone out there uh, is associated with, with um, you know, either jurisdictions or, uh, or projects that are trying to, you know, aggregate um, DAC providers or, or any ki other kind of carbon capture providers, you know, we'd love to help you spread the word and, and, and connect you with the teams here. So, um, so I'm, I'm just going to, you know, we got to punt, punt the ball a little bit <laughs> into next okay. year, but it's definitely something we're um, interested in. Uh, and another one is uh, together, maybe it's about the, the branding that, that we could use uh, to, uh, to say that we are under this competence and, and maybe this use for, for our objective. So what can I do? What, what can? Uh, sorry, sorry I, I just missed the question. Can you repeat that? Uh, sorry, it's about the, the branding that we could as a team use. Mm. So it's, it's going to be easy for everyone to say, okay, we are in this uh, under the competence. So we would like to uh, obtain some um, facilities, some uh, help to prepare the best as possible to present for you the information and the supports that you could uh, check. No? So, so what kind of branding? So we are in this competence, but what can we say about that publicly? Uh, yeah, good question. I believe, uh, Nikki, you might have the answer for this if you're on here, but um, uh, I believe we have a, um, like a guideline for, uh, with, with, you know, branding considerations and some language that you can use around the competition. We I do. think you can find it on the resources tab in POP. Yes. Lupa, can you confirm That's that? That's correct. Um, if you have a POP account, which everyone here should, since you're all registered teams, um, log in and there's a resources tab. We have a tools and comms uh, section of that resources tab that will have a guideline that our marketing team has prepared um, that will guide you on how to brand yourself and represent yourself as a uh, part of the competition. Okay. So, okay. Um, so I just want to uh, send a, uh, just mention, we really like to focus on questions for our speakers today, specifically directed uh, to our air track speakers. I know there's tons of questions from all of you, um, but we we would like to focus on that today. Um, we do have office hours coming up next Tuesday that we will have weekly um, until the submission uh, deadline of, of February 1st. Um, the information on how to join those is on our website under the upcoming events and webinars page. So please, um, we really want to reserve this time we have for our air track speakers. Okay, so the next question up is um, from Ted Von Hippel. Hi, Rupa. Thanks. This question may actually be for Holly and for you, but I know Holly just uh, signed out. And that is that the DAC technology and the sequestration technology are really different things. So uh, teams on here will be working either on one or the other and have to um, work with each other. So is the competition set up or would the competition be set up so that one DAC team could pair with more than one carbon sequestration team and vice versa? There's also sort of geographical reasons to do that because DAC may be done in many places around the world as so will carbon sequestration. Um, there's no prohibition to that in the competition, um, but uh, what what we what we want to do is is have each team entity um, should have its own pathway. You know, so if you if you have if you have multiple varying pathways, you know, then you should register multiple teams um, and have multiple submissions. But if you kind of have one pathway that's being demonstrated in a variety of different locations with a variety of different um, actors involved, that's totally fine. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, uh, next question is from Cars to Trees. Hi, this is Amir. I'm from Cars to Trees. I have a question for Michael. Actually, um, uh, we in Cars to Trees, we have a, a, a project that it's disassembling in a mountain on each car. And we're following the claim work technology in capture, uh, the DAC, which is direct air capture. Uh, the problem we have, uh, for sure, uh, I had this one in a previous meeting. We, we won't be ready for the first phase because we don't have any prototype. All the time we spend is for digital demonstration right now. When I say digital, I'm talking about the ANSI SOLIDWORKS and our PTC. We put all the data capture very quickly in the in the uh, engineering softwares and uh, we have a we have a, a, a visualization for everything on our assembly on the car and uh, we, we we are selecting collecting a lots of data but unfortunately is not enough for the first milestone uh, but uh, still we're going to submit our our uh, plan for this uh, because we want to have some assessment on our plan but the problem is we have and i the question i have how we can have access to a verifier and because the company or the any any organization that uh, we need to reach them as a verifier or to have the, spend time to uh, for verification on our plan they they're not answering any email they're not answering the phone and i don't know how to reach them for example uh, especially claim work and right now i send a direct message to uh, francis from claim work as well. I, I sent a bunch of email because we, we are for, we, we didn't innovate the wheel again. We using whatever direct air capture is available. We customize that as a, uh, as a mobile platform, which is able to install on each car. And uh, each car, as uh, a cars to trees means the car is going to change to equal with the 450 trees to capture the CO2 uh, during the year and all the resources available. I don't want to go through the details for that, but uh, nobody uh, nobody as a verifier or as a, or as a mentor or as a, somebody that just uh, give us some idea that we are going in the right direction or not, they're not give us any answer. They not uh, hmm. pick up yeah. their phone. They don't yeah. uh, answer the email. And that's a big challenge we are faced with. For next phase, uh, we are gonna uh, we are going with our own pocket to start to making the prototype, very simplified prototype based on the bomb we created right now. In the digital model, we create all bomb, uh, bill of material and all the design, all the print, everything modeled, everything is ready and uh, we are uh, starting the prototyping for next phase, probably for uh, grand milestone, we're going to be there. But for first phase, uh, no, yeah. because of time. But how's, yeah. how's the XPRIZE yeah. going to recommend or support some company? Some We are not company as well. We are a team. We are the engineering sure. team working in this idea. Yeah, I How think we I can understand. get access to verifier or some mentor uh, access, mentoring support? Yeah, a couple of a couple of thoughts there. So, so the first point is, um, it, and this is this is for everybody. If you're not in a position to do a demonstration that meets the phase one requirements, that's okay. You're more than welcome to uh, participate in in phase two and compete for the grand prize. So, um, don't feel like you're being cut out of the competition if you're not in a position to submit to phase one. So that's that's totally fine. Um, regarding the verifiers or or onboarding mentors. I, I can't be of much help there. It really is up to each team to, um, to find the appropriate people to, you know, to partner with or work with or, or hire, um, both to provide advice and, and to provide verification. Um, I'll just note that, that uh, I, I wouldn't encourage teams to, um, to reach out to, you know, other developers to verify their, um, their, uh, uh, their, their equipment um, verification needs to be by a third party who was not involved in the design of, of that equipment. Um, and there are lots of you know, engineering companies and, and engineering consultants who would be uh, in a position to help you there. I don't have a list off of hand and it's really up to you to, to find those people. So um, just encourage you to keep, keep going. Um, I guess the other resources I could point out are um, 
Uh, you know, there are some good groups uh, online which have a lot of experts in the space hanging out on them. Um, the Air Miner Slack channel is a really good one. Um, somebody also set up a Discord channel, a Discord server for uh, the competition. Um, and there are some others out there. There's a, there's a um, CDR group on Google Groups and um, things like that. So, so you, you could uh, le leverage those other uh, forums to, to try and help, you know, help find uh, mentors, uh, partners, verifiers, that sort of thing. So uh, Ken, uh, sorry, just very quick. <laughs> Uh, do we have any support, any any line that uh, with that line we can introduce ourselves better to the to this uh, mentors that they they pay attention to the plan we are because the verifying this uh, this plan for example our plan I'm talking about my plan it's it's very simple because everything is already there everything every yeah. engineering model there every data collected all the CFD all the answers analyze everything is there and we yeah. just need somebody pay attention to us yeah <laughs> but i understand is I there think, anything you know, from xprize to can help us in that to I, I i can't give you any help right now um in the new year we are going to be planning some uh some sessions around uh pitching to investors and things like that and so that so those sessions might help you um hone your pitch a little bit um, but you know, we also have really. If you if you look at the uh, the partners for XPRIZE Carbon Removal, we have partnerships with other incubators and other organizations who are um, have resources to help help you um, you know refine your pitch and 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 do that. So I could point you in that direction. Okay, thank you. I appreciate okay, it. Thanks for the questions. Okay, next question we have is from Elizabeth. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my question is regarding the third party verification. Just real quick, I have a question about that. Um, let's say you have someone who is deemed to be an expert and you want them to verify and they're not a part of the X prize um, preliminary, you know, the, um, the milestone competition. Let's say they, they were, and I decided to use them as a third party verifier. Let's say you know they decide to register for the grand prize would that be a conflict of interest or would that still be okay for this no case? that's fine yeah that's fine the the uh we've tried to define the we have two requirements for verifiers they have to be qualified and independent and we've tried to identify we've tried to articulate those fairly clearly in the checklist that we've issued um but but one note on on independence um that doesn't necessarily mean they have to be independent of the competition. They have to be independent of your team and your technology. So even if they are actively competing in the competition on another team or, or working with another team, that's totally fine, provided they, they, they're independent of your team and your technology. Um, any other potential conflicts of interest within that are really up to you to manage, um, but that's, that's, not, um, that's not XPRIZE's concern. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Next question we have is from Kevin Klaus. Um, hi. hi. Our question is if we have a cheaper way than the standard standardized cost to um, get electricity, for example, if we make it ourselves or if we have a contract with a cheaper green electricity provider, can we use our actual costs in the calculation? For this round, we'd like all of the teams to use the standardized costs that we've provided. However, you should note that in the comments that you have that you have a cheaper source. That's that's my first piece of advice. The second piece of advice is we've also asked you to do a sensitivity analysis around a few of the parameters um, that that are the key drivers to your cost. And so so that cost of electricity might be a good um, factor to highlight in the sensitivity analysis so you can show the effect of that lower electricity price on the overall price of carbon removal. Okay. And if we, for example, if we make it ourselves, the electricity, and let's say we, we build a wind turbine, does that fall under the electricity cost or can we just uh, calculate the cost of the turbine in our like included in our calculations? Um, well, uh, anything that you build would need to be accounted for as capital costs. So, so again, you know, th that, so capital costs are another great place to, uh, 
to uh, include in your in your uh, sensitivity analysis. Um, so uh, uh, there would be some operating costs that you'd want to that you'd want to include there. Um, the approach that we took in the um, in the uh, this, the calculation of the standardized cost is a, you know, those costs are an LCOE figure. So you can look up references on how that stands for levelized cost of electricity. Um, and if you follow those standards to calculate your own LCOE, that's fine. But and this is very important. You must account for intermittency in your plans. If you're building uh, re especially renewable capacity on your site, you have to be able to articulate how that intermittency is, uh, is accommodated. Uh, that means either your whole facility needs to have a capacity factor that reflects that intermittency, or you have to have some way of, of providing energy during the downtime, whether that's pulling off the grid, which is totally fine, or implementing battery storage, or, or some, or some you, know, you know, even diesel generation is fine, as long as you account for the costs and the emissions associated with that. Okay, thank, okay. You. thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, hey, question from Ashley Chi. Next. Oh. Hi, uh, can you see, can you hear me as Ashley? Yes. Yeah. Okay. My name is Ashley Steve. I read, I wish I had Ashley's name. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so um, at any rate, we have a couple of questions. If I could just very briefly say that uh, if you just think of our our thing as a black box, uh, <clears throat> what we have, we are building artificial life. Like it is obviously since they're an amalgam of both a fungus and an algae. <clears throat> they have algae in them. Algae have the talent of being able to produce carbon, and we rely on that. We basically treat this as a barium. Uh, we stack these things up <laughs> in old used um, uh, 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 shipping containers that are a meter cube. We basically build big, large terrariums uh, that are stackable and scalable. And the reason I'm, I'm going into that detail is I'm really struggling with figuring out what DAC really means, what direct air means, whether it's the direct air. For instance, inside my terraria, all I really need is about 20,000 parts per million. I don't want anyone that's toxic to algae, too much for that. But if I just stack those, uh, those, let's just say, stack those next to a biomass conversion facility, there's, there's plenty of CO2 around ambient fires. Is that DAC? I'm not hooked up to a point source. Is that DAC is my first question. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, no, no issues from my perspective. Um, we do not treat, I mean, we, we've, we're asking you to sort of self-identify in a particular track in your submission. Um, the reason we do that is so that we can make sure that we get the right experts looking at your proposal. Um, but all the teams are competing with all the other teams. So, so if you kind of misidentify yourself or whatever, we'll just reroute you internally. So that, that's, you know, I don't, I don't want anyone to be stressed out about which uh, pathway they indicate in their submission. Mm, okay, I'm not sure exactly how. But anyway, what you said was very important to me. It's not the worst off. But I just described to you just independently stacking black boxes that do the uh, up in and around a biomass conversion facility is not problem. Now, if I were then to stick that pipe in from the biomass conversion facility on petroleum based uh, and stick that into the black box. Um, yeah, I, so I, I, you kind of cut out there, um, but I think you're asking about whether you can, you can consume CO2 from a facility that combusts biomass, is that right? Yes. So that's fine, provided you can account for the, the, basically the cultivation, the growth and cultivation of the biomass has to be a part of your system. So you need to be able to account for the cost, emissions and sustainability associated with the source of the biomass. But um, in terms of scope, that's totally fine. So if our, if our biomass conversion facility is integral to the, the plant, and we're burning wool and all nuts in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, then we're, we're... So I have one more question, and it relates to what the biomass. Right? Um, uh, our system actually generates, as its byproduct, cellulose, just like that. Um, and um, what I'm trying to noodle out Obviously, we all agree that cellulose, as, a, as it stands in a tree at 30 years old, uh, is a suitable 
100 year sequestration mechanism. We can argue about that, but um, everybody's pretty comfortable with that. Um, if instead of the cellulose coming from <coughs> tree, uh, and we harvest it on a regular basis. Uh, is there any reason why that you know uh, cellulose from, say, cellulose, cellulosic sources <laughs> differently? Or do we have to go up and prove out, we have to do some sort of uh, weathering study, I guess it's what, um, with word cellulose that comes not from trees, remember, uh, bacterial need to come up with a study? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That's not a question that I, I think that I can answer. That's a little bit too in the weeds. Um, and I'm not an expert on, on, um, on that specific question. Um, so just try to answer your question generally. Um, you know, when it comes to the, uh, the durability of your sequestered CO2, or the or even the durability of of call them byproducts or co-products of your yeah. system, um, the the you know the, you, you be be prepared to provide justification. You know, academic justification is is okay. Experimental justification is probably better. Um, just just kind of do your due diligence in terms of in terms of making that case. At, the, at that point in the game, when, you, when the judges are reading this, it's about giving them confidence that you know what's going on, that you have control over your process and that you can tell us with certainty what the, what the, um, the, you know, the key performance parameters of your system are. Well, that's good. So the only thing I'll cap off, I don't want to nominate this, is that uh, I have access to material testing things. So I don't know if I can get it done, done by February 1st, so that's my problem. Uh, as far as the sequestration portion of what we have to first, uh, how, how far down the pike does that have to have traveled? Uh, for February 1st, uh, we don't require demonstrations that are full in scope or full in scale. They can, the demonstrations can be subsets of your overall system. So um, you need to be able to articulate your plan for how you're going to build that out over the next couple of years. But in terms of the, the actual demonstrated component, um, it's really your choice uh, about, about how far down the rabbit hole to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. okay. Good luck, so, everybody. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have time for one more question um, because, as promised, uh, the next part of this session is going to be breakouts. So um, the next question is from Peggy Bradley, or, and the last question will be from Peggy Bradley. Uh, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, my question is to Michael, and it has to do with the 1,000 ton uh, proof that the judges will come and look at our sites. The question I have has to do with our solution. Uh, a lot of the carbon that we're sequestering is going to be in forests or in trees. And two years within a cycle, those, those forests are not producing the type of tons of CO2 they will later. And in other words, the first 10 years of a forest, it's not really very productive. And so uh, to allow a forest solution to be in the uh, competition, if we can take our 100 year cycle and divide it up into 100 years saying that we're sequestering that much. In other words, another way of accounting for our first 10 years, uh, it would um, allow us to be in the competition. Um, you know, we're committed to trying to make sure that uh, everybody who is, who, who, you know, everybody who's doing real carbon removals can compete in this competition. So uh, in historically, like especially, especially towards the end of the competition, when we're dealing with uh, selecting um, folks for site visits, um, you know, our general practice is to work with teams very closely to make sure that, that we do a verification that, that is tailored to it's the tailored nature of the demonstration. Nature. So, um, so I just want to kind of give you that assurance that we're happy to work with you on that. Um, however, uh, the requirements of the competition are clear in the guidelines and we can't deviate from those. So, so you know, it's, it is up to each team 
to come up with a system that meets those requirements too. So I, I'm, I'm answering your question generally. I can't, I don't know enough about what you're saying to, um, to, you know, kind of say yes or no. Um, and I, and I'd be, I, I'd be, be loath to do that anyways. Um, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not, I'm, my role isn't to pass judgment on any teams, but to help communicate the requirements, the competition. So I hope that's kind of a helpful uh, answer, even if it, even if it kind of beats around the bush of the question. Um, uh, I think it's a matter of accounting, you know, in other words, whether we take our, what we're going to do in a hundred years and divide it up into a hundred units or whether we actually tell you how much we were able to put in the ground that year. I think that's, and uh, it's important because I, IPCC sees for us as one of our biggest opportunities. In other words, yeah. it, so if, if all it would really need is to be able to account in terms of how much we're gonna do in a hundred years, every year in those first two years, and that solves the problem. Um. All I can say is, is make that case in your submission. You know, okay. we, we, we want to see you compete. We want to see you win. Uh, read the guidelines very carefully and make your best case. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that is all the time we have for questions. Um, so what we're going to do next is put you all in breakout sessions. Um, we are going to keep you about nine to a room and we'll switch you every 15 minutes or so. Um, we'll do that three times. Um, but really the goal of this is to one, introduce yourselves to each other, two, give a quick one minute elevator pitch of your project, and three, if you're comfortable, share your contact details within the chat in your room. So I'm gonna be kind of automatically assigning you all to rooms, bringing you back, and then putting you in a different room uh, for the next two times. So. Let's go ahead and get that started now. And I just want to say, if you do have to drop, please feel free. Um, and uh, you know, you're you're welcome to drop. I uh, just want to give this opportunity to you all to network with each other. So, okay. Hello. How's everybody? Good, thanks. Hello, hello. Aloha from Hawaii. That was awesome. Marcus, you're in Hawaii? Well, that's... Yes, I am. Okay, the bandwidth wasn't good. I lived in Hilo for three years. Oh, then you're well acquainted with a mole. <laughs> so I don't know exactly what's supposed to happen here, and I guess it depends on what the overlap is in everybody's area. Um, some people were on the director capture side. Some people were on the sequestration side. I'm on the director capture side, or at least my team is. I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that. Okay, there were, um, oops, go ahead, please, go ahead.
Interesting. So do you expect to get your energy from um, wave energy, for example, or wind? Interesting. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Thanks. Um, I guess I'll, I'll jump in. Um, Paul Wire, I'm on the Yame team, which is the one led, led by Brittany Zimmerman, who I'm sure you've seen in the sessions. Um, we, we have elements of ocean and air capture, uh, and then we also have the sequestration side as well. Um, so a couple of our products are going into aggregates um, for, for construction and also clean water for drinking. So I can't say too much about the technologies in between, unfortunately. <laughs> And I'll go next if, if that's okay. Uh, the I'm looking mostly on the, the sequestration side uh, to um, uh, go to uh, go to from carbon dioxide to graphite or and diamonds because they are easily provable as permanent uh, sequestration. They both have a very high market value. And even if people use them, they're going to leave them in the form that is sequestered. Uh, and both of those can be uh, accomplished through, uh, uh, with, without too much complexity with chemistry. So we don't have to do a lot of other, uh, other craziness. The, the graphite seems compelling from the value of its cost, but do you know how rapidly the market would change if you start dumping kilotons or megatons? Or more onto the market of graphite or of of diamonds, because the diamond the diamond that would be problematic, and and, and there is a engineering requirement within there where there is obviously a much higher market value of diamond versus graphite, and so we will we would definitely be producing much less diamond uh, than graphite. But no, gra the graphite market is already in the gigaton scale annually. So if we were to it, if we were to be dumping that on there, I mean, we could we could be selling that at current market prices, and we'd be able to get to we we would be able to easily get past gigaton scale before we ran into any market cap situation. And if since graphite is going to be used more as more electric cars are used, batteries are built, if we maintain similar technology, it's a growth market. So I, I really don't see that 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 graphite would be problematic. Diamond would. <laughs> And also diamond has a much slower production rate in, anyway. So you really, I mean, uh, as a, there's an optimization there, it's, it's a, a lot of it's going to be financed out of diamond because it's a quicker turnaround. But I think long-term your, your value really is in the graphite. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah, the, the, and I would say that really I say graphite, I, but that's only because um, it's a direct approach. In fact, what we actually can produce off of this is, is actually graph, uh, graphene. Um, and, but it's more difficult for me to prove that it's graphene at the moment. I can prove to you it's graphite, but it would take a lot more effort to get it down to a fully. But again, that, that puts that particular thing at a much higher price point than just straight graphite. But Where does the energy come from to get the oxygen off the CO2 and make it graphite or graphene? 
Um, well, it's a uh, uh, endothermic thing. You, uh, I'm not going to... Uh, the, the the specifications of that is uh, uh, electricity, solar power is how we're going to be generating that. Um, the the systems exist, um, but they're just not scaled correctly, and they're targeted at, at something completely different. They're they're currently used for life support systems uh, on uh, 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 space stations. Those are the words. Uh, but uh, and and. What's interesting is that all of their uh, problems with it, uh, it produces methane, it produces graphite, are things that are like amazing for what we want to do. Uh, so we're, we're looking at, we're taking the existing tech and we're kind of saying, hey, if you flip it on its head, all these problems go away and they become advantages. Interesting. But yeah, I would love to, I'd love to talk with people about uh, pushing this one forward a little bit more than, than where it's at right now. Marcus, did you want to say anything? Well, first of all, I'm happy to be here. The, um, my area of uh, concentration is actually seawater extraction. However, the Zoom meetings for the day experience uh, technical difficulties. So I want to thank Andrew for collating all those meetings and recording them and putting them in one place on YouTube, I did copy the message. Uh, so I'll be, uh, I will be doing everything. Uh, but again, my specialty is seawater. I'm just here to uh, everybody's uh, ideas. I find the idea of uh, recycling the station uh, filters fascinating. It's analysis to the process that I want to use. Um, also, the, um, the idea of um, realizing temperature difference in the oceans is something that uh, occurred to me. We are doing an ocean-based uh, technology. However, we're not using that energy source at all uh, because we're going to be focused in uh, international uh, cargo. Uh, shipping ports. But it's fascinating. So, Marcus, I'm having a lot of trouble hearing you. Could you try turning off your camera so that you're not sharing bandwidth on the audio? Okay. Is it is it in or is there a like down? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Yeah, the, your voice was very choppy. Oh, okay. We got, I think we got a fair amount of it, but I'm not really sure. And you were also thanking Andrew for recording things uh, so that you can see him later. Um, very good. Will do, Andrew. Yeah, it is. Unfortunately, I feel strange. I'm just talking to my phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I only said that I'm working on the director of capture side. I didn't say more, and I don't have a lot more to say now without getting into the details of the technology. But um, we're looking at a combination of um, thermal and chemical approaches to direct air capture and uh, have a team of, of uh, engineers where I'm at it, at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach and a few collaborators in other places. We've written a few papers on the thermal side of it and um, we're continuing to explore. I don't see our group doing the sequestration side of the room. Sorry, getting feedback from somewhere. Um, but they're pairing up with another team. Uh, 
Yeah, you know, I think it's the uh, trade wind breeze is blowing the window. I'm getting a wind to win in there. Marcus, what you might do is just mute when you're not talking, and then when it comes out of your speaker, it won't go back down the pipe. Sure, I tried that. Uh, unfortunately, it muted you as well. Oh, okay. I Technology. <laughs> I think putting your video off helped a lot, and uh, I'm sorry we didn't see you at that point, but it really did help with the audio. There I go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I'm getting a leave room button. I don't know if the rest of you know. Okay. Okay. We're getting an audio echo loop from. Okay, that takes it. Well, um, yeah, so I was going to say we have this leave room, and I guess we're supposed to join another group shortly. But um, it's interesting here, the range of different projects. And I think what the X Prize has done is uh, started to create a community. And I'm interested to hear what other people are doing. Uh, hopefully, it'll stretch ideas. And whatever ideas don't work, it's great that there are so many ideas out there being developed. All right, great. See you guys later. Recording in progress. Hello, I left my breakout room. I would like to move into the next breakout room. Yes, we're just waiting until everyone's back and then I'll, I'll go ahead and do that for you all. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just waiting for the total number that comes back because uh, I can distribute you all uh, in the way that makes sense there. Uh, Hello, Rupa, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, just let me get everyone into the breakouts first. I, I have a question. Can I? Okay, one second. 83. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Are you guys all in the uh, the air track, or what are your teams? Yeah, we're air track.
I love to hear the word deserts because we're actually growing bamboo in the desert um, and we're using biochar um, as a key component as well to sequester carbon and creating like uh, sustainable forests and managing those as well. So I think I saw you in the ocean track meeting, Andrew. Great. I put I put my contact in in the uh, chat. Um, uh, I'd appreciate it if others would do the same, and then I'm going to take a screenshot of that. Um, and uh, my team is Carbodynamics, and I'm planning to take uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequester it by uh, combining it uh, basically with magnesium. We're burning magnesium and carbon dioxide, producing uh, um, pure carbon and then storing the carbon. And I've got, a, I think, a unique way of storing it. And anybody who's going to make any kind of biochar, I would like to help you store it. Do you know anything about bamboo biochar, Grant? Well, you're going to grow it in the desert. And I think that what I have in mind specifically um, would fit into that kind of a situation. Well, I would love to speak with you then, Grant, and uh, get your email. I also attached my email here. Um, okay. We're not only going to be focusing on bamboo, but bamboo is a huge component. So bamboo biochar is what we're going to be doing. So, yeah, Any biochar will, will suit my purposes. Nice to meet you, Grant. Okay. I also just put in my information. Uh, I'm part of a company called Carbon Canton. We're... Uh, doing both direct air capture and conversion of the CO2 uh, into graphite. And with that, we're uh, actually producing a lot of energy because it's a very exothermic reaction and we're planning to use that to heat up the other parts so we don't have to rely on uh, too much on external power sources and push ourselves towards the net negative uh, with our project. That's great. Um, let's see who else hasn't said anything yet. Ne is it, how do you pronounce it? Neil? Neil? Yes. Yeah, Hello. what's your project? My project is uh, small and is uh, sucker, sucker the, the carbon by the air and you, the, I take this the air and we are working by two filters because we like to do, like to show in how filter is better for taking the carbon. And it's uh, smaller, it's a container and you can move in for every place in the world. You can build in every place in the world. It's cheap and the brush that you have uh, about this container, um, you can reuse it in the industry. We are work. We are. We are work, We are talking about the industries for knowing how how they do it about the residues, and they told us they can do it uh, something like glass, and and another materials. And we are working with renewable energies because the 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 prototype is uh, is functionally with uh, solar plates and and uh, now we are working for knowing how it's better uh, because uh, we like to know how filter using better. Uh, I'm sorry because uh, he, uh, my married, his Nirvignolas, have more uh, knowledge about the technical music. 
but he, for the languages is very bad. And I have another handicap. I I try to or I speak a little more English, but the technical uh, the technical is most difficult for me. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. And for business, we are a team. <laughs> Very good. You probably speak more languages than all of us on this call, so that's okay. Um, I uh, so my my project is uh, actually an airborne solution. Uh, we're building uh, our plan is to build a lighter than air platform that will carry um, a solid state carbon sequestration system that'll take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and break it out into carbon solid and oxygen gas to release into the atmosphere and then just sprinkle the carbon dust onto the earth for, as a fertilizer or whatever. Um, so completely neutral. Um, we, we're still kind of seeking partners in that particular technology. My focus is on the aerial platform and on the um, just sort of the business model to keep it afloat. So the benefit is a lot of you know ground-based direct air capture are using fans. We don't need to use fans because we can use the propulsion of the aircraft, which is solar powered, to go through the atmosphere and pick up the, you know, scoop up the atmosphere and process the carbon dioxide from it as it scoops it. Um, and then what keeps us in the air uh, is a lighter than air. We're using basically hot air and a super insulated envelope. Um, so it'll be sort of like a, a disc shaped aircraft it won't be like a balloon it'll be a, a larger flatter surface with a large solar panel array on the top on the top um and also uh we will be using the aircraft to support uh broadband so we'll basically like loon, like google loon had their sort of uh internet service that they could put on these high altitude weather balloons this would be more of a permanent sort of satellite we call it vertisat that would stay in the atmosphere and provide uh, low cost broadband to poor countries or rural areas in the US or wherever. Um, and that would be the sustainment model that would fund then the maintenance and all of the other things that it would cost uh, to keep the aircraft up. Um, also things like uh, imagery would be able to sell aerial photography and videography and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, basically we've kind of tried to create a financial model and an efficient model for scooping atmosphere without having to burn fossil fuel on the ground to actually power fans to then remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We're actually just gonna be up in, in it. Um, I'm looking for partners that have a solid state method of taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and breaking it down into carbon and solid carbon and, and oxygen gas. Um, so that's, that's where I'm kind of, on the weekend of this whole thing. And I'm, I'm really, you know, my focus and my expertise is in the aviation side of it um, and on the business model side. Oh, you, uh, I'm sorry. I think I understand. Do you like working together? Because you're using the turbo fans, you're, you're working with turbo fans for cleaning the air. Yes. Okay. I think I, I think yes we can do it and because um, we using some we using funds for for observation the CO2 the carbon for for uh, cleaning the atmosphere that'd be great um, I sent I put my email address in the chat did I do okay it? On, let me make sure I did it. <laughs> I, I've been in a couple of rooms now. I'm working. I, I, I'm working. I'm wrote, I'm wrote writing. Uh, okay. Um, I send you the mail, or do do you like send me the mail, and and we can working together or talking yeah. about. That's great. What's your? Where's the? Uh, did you put your? Your carbon okay. no, you're not carbon dynamics. Mine's Pete at Airbuoyant. It's in the chat. Uh, we are uh, Vignola's team, and uh, and the uh, mail is Neil Vignola's 
like like rotating in, in the in the. Could you type it in the like in the chat? Arroba Yahoo. Point com. I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand. Could you could you just type it in the chat? Would that be okay? Yes, I I, I can wrote here in in the in the chat. Perfect. I'm sorry because. No, that's okay. It's just easier to understand that way. It's I won't make a mistake. Okay, I sending. I got it. Perfect. Okay, I just screenshotted everybody's, so that's awesome. Amazing. All right, um, Elizabeth, what are you guys? So you're doing bamboo with carbon char, and then I don't think we heard from David yet. Yeah, I'm I'm doing that, but David can David can talk. <laughs> Uh, sure, David Lenowitz, uh, Zero Carbon Partners. Um, I've got a uh, DAX solution moving towards uh, putting up a pilot plant, hopefully the next uh, 12 to 18 months, most likely located in uh, Durham, North Carolina. Awesome. And Looks if like anyone is interested in bamboo or, or would like to plant bamboo, um, you know, we're over here in Texas, Peru, and, um, you know, we're going to be expanding and demonstrating over in Arizona and some other uh, dry southern states. That's pretty impressive. I I'm fascinated by the stuff that I don't do because there's a lot of just <laughs> unique talent that just sort of blows my mind. Um, Oh yeah, being a part of this competition for sure. Just hearing everybody is so amazing. Very fun. All right. Well, uh, I guess they're going to kick us out here in a few seconds. So it's good. Good meeting everyone. <laughs> Hope you nice to meet everyone. everyone. Great. Merry Christmas. Okay, everyone, um, we've got one more breakout before we will close. Um, I had a question about the recordings. Uh, will the recordings all be posted um, pretty soon? Yeah, once we're done with the this session, um, we'll need a little bit of uh, a little time to just get everything cut and ready and you should receive an email um that will have a link to all the recordings from this week um i can post the, the link to the discord as well if anybody's familiar there we had there's an x prize ox or an x prize discord that was created i don't know if it's official x prize or not but it has quite a few people from all the meetings that we had this week so sure. if you want to post that in the chat that would be ready uh, or that would be great um and uh the recording from monday is already yeah. available as well let's see I'm just gonna put you all into this last room. Um, and I'm also putting a link to our office hours, which will be next Tuesday, the 21st at 9 a.m. Um, like I mentioned before, we, we are doing those weekly um, uh, until the February 1st milestone submission deadline. So that's an excellent, uh, Excellent uh, place for you to come and ask all the questions that you want. We don't have an agenda. It's really just um, office hours, open Q&A. So I'm gonna put that link here in the chat for everybody, just quick reference. As far as the recordings go, are there any types of records of transcripts from the recordings? Um, if I have to check um, if there, if we've, selected closed captioning automatically, then there should be a transcript. Um, but I know that we do save the chat and um, the Q&A from a webinar format, so. All right, thank you. Okay.
And hi again. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. Again. Hi, Peggy again. And Walter. <laughs> Peggy, I, I tried to chat with you. I don't know if you saw my chat, but I, I'm very interested in what you're doing with the trees. I don't know if you know, but bamboo is very, very productive and can definitely work alongside trees as well. Um, and I'm also interested in what you were saying about the, you were had affiliation with the UN and like you were working with hunger, some organizations about world hunger. That's really interesting. I would love to email you. Hello. Hello. Yes, I have just joined the chat. My, my name is Ashley. What do you do, Ashley? Um, I am representing our team. It is Team CO2AT. We are actually part of a company named Reactive Surfaces, and we help to specialize in polymer coatings uh, using algae-based contents. Um, and that is supposed to, and that has been helping to alleviate the carbon removal problem across the globe. And as far as uh, what I'm looking for is I'm looking to connect with um, corresponding engineers and people in the polymer side of things or in the algae side of things that would be able to better assist us. Um, and uh, hopefully we can work to correspond and possibly work together. Hi, yeah, I'm um, on a team, Blue Sky. We're growing algae in uh, bioreactors. Um, but it kind of sounds like you're looking for like individual people to talk to or uh, or other teams as well. Um, do you happen to be an engineer? Uh, I'm a student um, right now, so. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, Peggy, I just saw your chat uh, message to everybody. What is it that you specialize in? Hello? Oh, Peggy, hey. you're on mute right now. Sorry. I keep, I keep having dogs barking, so I hide. Um, I'm the CEO of the Institute for Simplified Hydroponics. And so we work with the hydroponics industry uh, to uh, make this technology available to those in need. So we work on hunger issues, particularly with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and others. And we've got projects in about 20 countries. And um, what I can, I've been doing it for 26 years. And, and part of what we're doing is capturing carbon by getting people to do afforestation. If you create a forest and you have extractive reserves, say it's ginseng or mushrooms or rubber, whatever, that it can be very, very valuable for your family way beyond uh, what would have been there with corn or wood. So that's what I do. And my expertise is very much in hydroponics in knowing how much can be produced with how much nutrient and that type of thing. How do you spell hydroponics? <laughs> H-Y-D-R-O-P-O-N-I-C-S. Oh, okay. Good. Thank, Thank you, you, Peggy. You, you are, I love to hear about it and I'm glad you, you put your email down. I will be emailing you. It's really exciting to see like how, you know, growing certain things like bamboo can really affect the community. And we are going to be demonstrating that as well. Um, and one of the countries we're demonstrating in is in Peru. And, uh, and I'm, you know, there's a, there's a lot of regions over there that uh, could really benefit from that, especially yeah. where they're doing illegal gold mining, illegal mining of all kind and deforesting the Amazonian regions. And there's a lot of like prostitution and gang uh, related violence over there. And just, I really, really truly believe that bamboo is um, a plant that can bring light in a lot of those dark places on this planet. Um there, there's a bunch of stuff about your project that I find exciting. We have a project in Peru, and I in Peru that I can put you in touch with, and it puts you in touch with the university. But um, be amazing. The, but the uh, the key, the one of the things about bamboo I was going to mention to you is that with biochar, we can do a substrate for hydroponic that's half biochar. And the other half could be something like corn stalks or maybe something that is part of your agricultural waste. 
uh, we should certainly try it because if it works, then you get rid of things like perlite or other expensive um, substrates. That sounds super interesting. I am definitely going to be emailing you, Peggy. Thank you so much. I was wondering about yes. Anna, what type of student are you? You said you were a student? Oh yeah, so I'm a computational biology student. So I'm doing like molecular computing and um, I'm, I so do like a lot of just all interdisciplinary, but um, doing undergrad still, I took a few years off. Yeah, thanks. Uh, in Oregon. At, in Oregon. at Oregon State? No, I'm at Portland State. Um, I'm in the Portland State Honors College, and then I do undergraduate research in the Tusher Lab um, here in the Department of uh, Engineering. That is so cool. Thanks. I have a lot of fun. <laughs> and we're actually, um, we're actually uh, really, we might be changing our name actually. We're, right now we're a land track, you know, with bamboo and biochar and all that, but actually we're, we are going to definitely be incorporating some aquaponics and maybe even some hydroponics. So, uh, you know, algae, um, all different kinds of plants. Uh, we want to create like some floating farms and things like that and just uh, incorporate all the elements together. I think the really interesting thing about algae is the sort of divergence of like, do you put the algae in like a riverbed that already exists that potentially is contaminated? I mean, there are a lot of algae streams that can, um, you know, capture carbon and purify water. Or do you create new like bioreactors to just independently grow algae? So I, I like that you bring that up because it kind of speaks towards like the nuance of using something that's like already found in nature and like how do you most efficiently utilize that resource i definitely think nature is the answer yeah, yeah. i think like it always is it always is she's always yeah. the cure we just need to work together in in a you know with human with human uh cooperation and assistance as well well yeah. i think i think that when you talk about nature being the answer I certainly feel that way, but we were just talking to a guy who is working on an invention to bring carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And it apparently is a small invention, but I was letting him know that we could certainly use that in greenhouses. You know, it, it's a huge, huge benefit. Uh, we could probably double our production in greenhouses if we could capture and then use the CO2. And I don't know why that hasn't been invented yet. <laughs> No. Yeah, that is, that's, I think about that a lot too, because to some point you, there's like a limitation of how much CO2 a plant can actually obtain because of just the ambient CO2 in the air. And I, I think what you're saying is exactly true because I, I'm just really excited to see the innovation because I think some of the best innovation is in that just like a tiny little step that just enhances the sort of overall process. So I'm just really excited to see what happens. Yeah. Hmm. Right, right. And that when you use it for food, you can't claim it, right? If you grow a biomass and then use it as food, even if it has captured more CO2, you cannot claim it as the quest. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem with uh, CO2 enhancement in most places is it's, it's done with fossil fuel in greenhouses. So in other words, we have a double whammy when we switch from grabbing it from the air because we also uh some people do co-generation you know they'll they'll generate right at the greenhouse and capture that heat but um they haven't really uh done much with the co2 there occasionally yeah 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 anya could you please leave your email as well yeah sorry yeah definitely thank you 
would love to know more about what you're doing and also you and Peggy, like what's, you know, uh, what you guys have heard about that, that technology about the enhancement and enhancements in the greenhouse. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. It's nice just to sort of like chat about the actual technology itself. Yes. We need to hear from more people. I think so. I've seen Walter here before, but um, could you tell us what you do? Hello, my name is Walter Rubén Vargas Valderrama, the from Mexico City. Um, my project is Technofibro SSS, a new innovation and prior to, um, the filter purification a cleaner. Um, it's my project, this company in Mexico, is new, form, is new formula chemical unicorn in the world. Uh, the best and um, results and uh, laboratory, laboratory test. I'm sorry, my English now is good. This is little. Uh, the international certification, uh, non. 043. It's demonstration the quality, the purification air. This is my project, um, the company Mexico. Um, um, this is my project. Walter, I just want to say that looks really cool. Um, I, I, I'd be curious to, All right. to see how you're um, doing All right. capture and sequence. My, my level of English is uh, scotchy, but, my, but uh, listen careful. Oh, I'm sorry. I get you have eight seconds. Speak up. And <laughs> back quickly. Um, thank you all for joining us on our last um, XPRIZE Carbon Removal Virtual Team Summit session. Um, we are I'm posting the link to our office hours one more time in our chat. Um, just give me one second here. Will those also be coming out by email to everyone? The office hours? Yes. So you can find that all on our website. Um, if you look at our main website, uh, there's a tab that's called uh, upcoming events and webinars. Um, so everything we've got planned is usually there. I mean, or it is there, um, as well as previous recordings. So we will be having those every Tuesday uh, until February 1st, with the exception of the holiday, obviously. Um, so next week's is our last one um, until after we're back in January. But yeah, those are open Q&A. Um, we figured there'd be a lot of questions between now and the submission deadline. So we wanted to make sure everyone um, has a chance to ask questions. But um, thank you all for joining us. We're gonna get all the recordings from this week together and send them out um, uh, today. So look for those. Um, we'll also be posting them um, on POP once we get all of them together. So thank you all again for joining and we will see you next time. Thanks all.
Thank Take you. Care. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Bye, bye. Thank Thank you. you. Have a good one. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye, bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Everyone. Bye. Bye. Yeah, you too. Bye. Everybody. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.